Our text for today comes to us from Matthew chapter 3, and I'm actually going to read the entire chapter here. So all the way to verse 17. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make God's paths straight. Now, John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire." Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is God's word to us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Good and loving God, thank you for today. And Lord, thank you for your word. And thank you for ancestors, God, who show us in times where we're asking, which ways to go. God, I pray that whatever words we would hear this morning would come from you and not from me. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anyone have a strong connection to ancestors in here? Do you know, does anyone do ancestry stuff at all? No one? A little bit? A little bit? Did you find anything interesting during that process? that you'd be willing to shout out real quick? Anyone, were you connected to anybody that maybe you didn't know you were connected to before? Or, you know, I, I feel like, yeah, Doris, do you? A painter that studied under Leonardo da Vinci, that's great, that's great. Um, a person who was, who, who were they? Okay, so imprisoned during the sense, okay, <laughs> I gotcha. So you come from a line of prisoners. That's great, Tim. <laughs> awesome. You know, that explains a lot. No, I, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. No, we, we find these interesting things when we do research. I, I don't know if you've ever done that or if you've ever asked questions, but, you know, I, um, I learned a lot about my family when I was doing some ancestry stuff, and I, I won't share a lot of that this morning, but uh, w- one of the things I learned about my last name was that... Um, you know, way back in the day in Poland, they, um, they identified classes by last name sometimes. And they still do this in Germany to some degree with uh, V-O-N, von. Um, and it, it's meant to signal kind of the aristocracy, I guess. And I, I don't really have an idea of what that is. But I met a, a woman who was a, a chaplain in Montana one time. She saw my last name. She said, oh, you're, you're of the royal Polish people. And I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I don't think so. My dad was a mechanic, and my mom came from farmers, so I, <laughs> I don't know anything about this royalty, but she went on to kind of explain that the SKI was more of an arist- aristocratic name, and I thought, oh, 
well, that's great to know. And then I did some more research, and it turns out she's actually kind of right. And not that we're necessarily royal, but uh, apparently some of my ancestors may have been, you know, a part of uh, what they called the gentry. So um, probably people who had, um, you know, okay jobs at a time when there were a lot of feudal lords. But I, I, I learned these things, and it kind of changed my relationship with my last name, you know, because I, I, my whole life I... I didn't really like my last name. It was, it was hard to pronounce. People always messed it up. I had to spell it like four times for everyone that asked. You know what I mean? Like it just, it was tough. But when she told me that, I thought, man, I, I wish I would have known that at a younger age. Maybe I would have owned it a little bit more. And I say that to say, you know, an ancestry can do us a lot of good. It can answer questions about ourselves. It can help us find our roots. It's an important thing. If you haven't done any of that, I'd really encourage you, talk Talk to folks in your family. Ask, ask those questions. I think we all need to be connected to our ancestors. You know, Matthew thinks this as well. Um, here in, in chapter 3, he's telling us about John the Baptist, but if you, if you back up a little bit to chapter 1, he begins his gospel of Jesus with this great genealogy. And it sort of echoes back to the uh, more boring parts of the Old Testament where there are just these lists of names and names and names and you begin to wonder, like, why, why are you doing that? And I think that Matthew, as a writer, is trying to tell us things about Jesus, right? But not just these random things, exactly where he came from. So if you start in chapter 1, what you learn is that Jesus is from the line of David. And we heard that in some of the scripture that was read this morning before the lighting of the candle. It comes from the root of Jesse, the stump of Jesse. And Jesse was David's father. And David is arguably the most famous and most beloved king in the line of kings that ruled over Israel. And so Matthew is telling us this Jesus comes from this kingly, priestly, sort of royal line. And that means something. But it doesn't mean what we might think it means, meaning that Jesus will come and he'll ascend to his throne and take it and then begin to rule over everyone like a good king might, however we imagine that is. Because Matthew does something really interesting in the genealogy. He peppers in these four women, which historically would never be thrown into a genealogy like that. And you, you may have heard you know, sermons on this before, that the four women were uh, all troublemakers. They're, they're all sort of considered promiscuous by the writers who tell their stories, but actually they end up doing good for a lot of people. And so, the, you know, Matthew is telling us that Jesus comes from this line of kings, but he's not a king like you might think he's a king. He's got this other history, this other genealogy that's in his bones. And then Matthew continues the story about Jesus. So it comes from this royal line of people. And then we get this virgin birth narrative. Now, growing up, I was always taught to read the Bible literally. And by literally, what I mean is, is, is more so historically, right? So you read it, and this is a recorded event of history. And I, I was taught in seminary that... That's likely not the case, but I don't want to disparage that reading of the Bible, but there are multiple ways that we can engage this text, right? But I, I, growing up, I just always thought, oh, this is the history, we're just recording it. Great. Um, you might be surprised to find out that two gospel writers don't mention <laughs> the virgin birth, which sort of makes us ask, well, why? Why? And I think it's because Matthew is trying to continue this story that he's telling about Jesus, about who Jesus was and is, by telling us that not only is he from this royal line, but also there's something blessed and holy and sacred about this person. Now, it might be the case that literally Jesus comes to us as a child of God. It might also be that Matthew, the storyteller, is trying to tell us something about this person and everything that happened in his life. And he's trying to interpret this for a new generation of believers that are really struggling to understand who was that Jesus character that lived. And so Jesus comes from this royal line. He has rights to be king on earth in some ways, and also he's a child of God, and in some ways we say now he is God, and so we know this about him. And then Matthew continues in the text we read for today to tell us a little bit more about who Jesus is. 
And he begins with this episode from John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, uh, as he's described in Matthew chapter 3, is kind of a wild person. He's, he's kind of a cave dweller. He wears really rough clothes. He eats bugs. He eats honey. And he seems to live alone by himself. <laughs> Except people keep coming out to find him, it appears, in the text. And I, I read some commentary that said, you know, he's, he's a huge inspiration for early Christian monks. Uh, who were really disillusioned with society and the societies they were living in and ended up leaving to try to find these authentic experiences of God. And so they used John as the model because John is also a priest. He also comes from a very special line of ancestors, and he's supposed to be working in the temple, but he finds when he gets to the temple that things really aren't the way that they should be that there's a lot of corruption, that there's a lot going on. You know, it's not like he had hoped it would be or how it should be. And so his response to all of that is to leave. He's not going to follow the way of his ancestors. He's going to make a pretty big break. He's not going to associate with the temple. Actually, what he's going to do, he's going to take the temple out into the wilderness. And he does. And he begins the process of baptizing people out there because you know, I, I think he's probably trying to live alone, but people keep coming to find him because what's this guy doing, you know? They're curious. They're curious. Well, these crowds begin forming, and they're coming out maybe to hear him teach, maybe just to sit with him in prayer, maybe because they're also looking for this authentic experience with God, and they're not finding it anywhere in the city. They're not finding it anywhere in the temple. And so John is doing his thing until one day, Matthew tells us, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of the religious leaders show up. And in what is maybe the most, uh, <laughs> most rude biblical passage <laughs> in, the Old Test or in the New Testament, uh, he calls them a brood of vipers. A brood of vipers. And I, you know, I just, I just love that. I, Anyone ever considered calling anyone a brood of vipers? <laughs> would, you, would you even take offense to that, you know? Um, we, it, maybe it's, it's lost in translation, but you can think of insults that you might deliver to a group of people that you don't really like. And this is what John is doing. And then he, he asks this question that is, uh, it's, it's pretty bad, actually. You know, who warned you of the wrath to come? He says to the religious authorities. Who warned you of the wrath to come? And I say it's kind of devastating because he's essentially saying to them, I don't know if I want you to be spared because you might be the problem, right? He's just using his words, though, and, and I think probably eventually, I, I want to say, and, and you could argue with this, and I, I couldn't really argue back, but I want to say he eventually baptizes them. I want to say that he does give in, but he has some really harsh words to deliver to them first. And they have to hear that. They have to accept it. And right after he gets done doing this, we get this portrait of who John is, right? He's the one who lives alone outside. He's the one who was supposed to be a priest and wasn't a priest. He's the one that curses at the religious authorities and actually gets himself into a little bit of trouble later. He is the one that also baptizes Jesus. He's the one that also baptizes Jesus. And I think this is probably the climax of this genealogy narrative that Matthew is weaving for us. So Jesus comes from this royal line. He's a child of God. And now he's also the disciple of the one who calls out the religious authorities and the corruption in our system. You know, John the Baptist, um, the way I think, I think Matthew and Luke tell it, it might just be Luke, but um, he, he's killed eventually because one of Herod's wives or one of his concubines doesn't like him and wants his head on a platter. Um, that, that, those are the gospel writers telling that story. The way the historians of the time told it, uh, this guy named Josephus, the, the way that he tells the story is actually that John's mouth had been running so much and this crowd had been gathering around him so much that Herod felt like he was going to be a threat. And so Herod 
the way Josephus tells it, basically made the decision that we just need to get rid of them before that's even a problem because Herod had enough issues on his own dealing with the Romans. And so John the Baptist, seen in this light, becomes a martyr in ways. And Matthew is telling us that Jesus is a king, he's a child of God, and he is also a student and a disciple of the martyrs. And he's telling us all of this to sort of tell us where this story is going, three chapters in. It's an old storytelling trick. Um, It it was used um, in the Midrash. The the Jewish uh, rabbis would interpret texts, and and one of the tricks they would use in the stories that they would tell was they would put the beginning and the end and the end and the beginning. And good, good writers still do this today. Good joke tellers do it. They bring things back around. And I think this is what Matthew is trying to do for us. He's trying to say (laughs) he might be all of these things, but he follows this way. And so the story is going to end with Jesus taking the same path as his teacher. And the story is told to us, I think, to the disciples at the time that Matthew is writing, to all of you that are here today, to remind us of our spiritual ancestry. Now, I want to acknowledge maybe some of you aren't Christian, you don't consider yourself Christian, you don't worship Jesus, you don't consider Jesus king, that's, that's fine. I still think there's something for us in Matthew, though, the reminder that we all have a spiritual ancestry, we all come from places, and sometimes it's good to remember those stories. Sometimes it's good to remind ourselves of where we come from, and as Christians, I think Matthew wants to remind us how narrow the way is that we've chosen to follow. That if Jesus is following John the Baptist and he was a martyr and then Jesus was a martyr for the cause and so many others after, we're reminded that this is also where we come from. This is who we belong to. And I wondered this week, what do we do with that? Because I can't sit up here and ask you all to, you know, go and be a martyr for the cause. Maybe I can. I don't know what that means, though. But this is our ancestry. This is where we come from. And I think we have to wrestle with it. And so the question I want to leave you with is, do you think about your spiritual ancestry? Do you think about those that came before you? How are they influencing you? How are they guiding you? How are they showing you the path and preparing the way ahead of you? Or are they? How are you reacting against them? I mean, John the Baptist completely makes a break with some of his ancestors and says, you know what, the, the, the priestly class, the temple, it's gone. I have to go this different way. I'm going to follow the way of the prophets, even if it means my life. Where are you in that spiritual line? And where's God leading you to go? Let's pray. Good and loving God, we do thank you again for today. God, we thank you for our ancestors, for those that came before. God, I pray you would lead us into the future that you're creating. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.